Good morning and welcome to the Coinbase Institutional Market School. It is Tuesday the 2nd of April at around about 11.45 in New York. The agenda for today, um, we have a fantastic market update with George, Greg and Sid. It's going to be an open conversation with everyone chipping in. We're going to be covering uh, ETF flows, the ISM and GDP data this week. Um, as well as reset in funding rates, some liquidations, and OI on CME and uh, also perpetuals. And um, we're also going to run through Farcaster base and update base and how much activity we've got on chain there. And um, then also DGEN L3 with a bit of an intro from Sid as to what DGEN L3 is and maybe some of the new use cases it enables. Um, but some quick housekeeping. If you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to scan the QR code to download all of David and the team's fantastic research. If you are watching or rather listening on podcast, then that information will be in your show notes. And regardless of where you're getting our content, please make sure you like and subscribe and give us a nice review. Um, if you like us, that is, of course. Um, anyway, without further ado, um, George, there has been a bit of a move this morning um, and we've had a bit of a whipsaw week as well. Uh, so what's been going on in the market? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, another pretty um, in interesting week. Um, I think price action wise, if we look at the last seven days, um, we have been going sideways in BTC and ETH for most of the week. And then a uh, bit of a rally into um, the end of Easter weekend on Sunday. And that's a pattern, in fact, that I think like you can see relatively often as we sort of go towards um, the end of the weekly close um, with funding rates heating up. So funding rates in uh, BTC were getting to 70, 80 percent annualized. But obviously a lot of that, as you say, got um, liquidated um, and cleaned out over the last 48 hours or so um, with um, uh, positive funding rates now being pretty much fully reset. We're down to um, five to ten percent uh, annualized on, on BTC again um, on on this latest uh, market drop, with um, a BTC trading as low as sixty four four hundred. So um, uh, down relatively or it's a relatively significant down move um, today. And um, for now, it, it does look a little bit like um, we're bouncing. I think a lot of folks were watching the um, uh, two hundred period EMA on the four hour chart in in Bitcoin, which is uh, right around sixty five five hundred. So had a pretty nice bounce off of that level right now um, at the time of the recording, trading around sixty six k. By the way, we we bounced off that level twice um, in mid March, and it's been decent support in February as well. So um, yeah, let's let's see how um, how the market continues to trade here. Interesting. So, we, so we've seen some liquidations on the move down. Funding rates have reset. Open interest still remains pretty high. And, and obviously, we've, we've got a decent level of open interest in the CME as well. I guess, what are some of the things that we're going to be looking for to try and define our next direction? Yes, I think... Um Obviously, the market has been quite focused on uh, ETF flows. Um, if you think back to two weeks ago, we had um, nine hundred million dollars of outflow during that week, and you know it's it's kind of like um, an obsession of the market in in the short term, I guess, um, to, to to focus on those. I think last week uh, we we had uh, relatively decent. Um, uh, inflows again. Um, if I just look at the numbers, it was probably ballpark around 750 million um, of inflows, and then uh, yesterday uh, again switched back to to outflows. So 85.7 million dollars of outflows um, yesterday. Uh, so that's going to be a key thing. Clearly, um, I think CME basis. Um, you mentioned it is is another thing. Um, it's been coming a little bit lower. We're now down to around nine and a half percent as of this morning. And just to paint the picture a little bit, um, CME basis annualized was at around 20 percent um, end of deck as we're going into the spot ETF approval. Um, and post approval, we uh, went down to five percent with a market correction. Uh, and then gradually back up to 15. So now we've been sort of on that leg down from 15 to um, to, to nine and a half. So I think the, these are going to be some of the uh, the key things um, to, to watch in the market. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. It was this is a podcast this morning and one of the oldest, I'd say, most respected traders in crypto was saying that no one cares about macro anymore. Everyone's just watching the ETF inflows, outflows, and, and that's kind of what's moving the market. That said... Um, we had some pretty important, or at least market moving macro yesterday. Um, what, what, what came out and I guess, how did the market react? 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think uh, so. Um, we had ISM manufacturing for March coming in at 50.3 versus 48.3 expected. Uh, we also a couple of days ago had um, Q4 annualized GDP coming out a bit stronger, 3.4 versus 3.2 percent expected. Um, so I think one thing or one way to look at the price section that we're seeing in crypto today over the last 48 hours as well could be that. Um, Crypto as an asset class is reacting a bit um, faster than other asset classes to the repricing and rate cut expectations. So, for instance, right now, we're actually only pricing 15 basis points of cuts by June. So the next two meetings included. So that's May and June. Um, and the first full cut is only priced by July now. Uh, like literally a week ago, we were pricing 20 basis points um, off of the cut uh, in June by comparison. So it is slowly getting with the data coming in stronger, um, it is slowly um, getting pushed further and further out, essentially. So that might be contributing. Yeah, 100%. Greg, we'd love to bring you in here. I know you're a fan of macro funding, ETF flows, all of the above. Which do you think are kind of the most impactful? Or is it kind of a combination of, of all three and, and other things that you tend to keep an eye on? Um, yeah, so it's a combination. Um, I mean, the macro environment can be summed up as, you know, the data is coming in hotter than a lot of people expected. Um, so long as we have hot data, uh, that means the Fed is less likely to cut. These prices, these cuts are getting priced out. Um, that's not good for financial assets. Um, now, I agree that crypto doesn't care about macro uh, as much as it did, say, you know, a year or two ago. Um, however, if we care about ETF inflows, we should care about macro because if the macro environment uh, changes or if, um, you know, traditional assets sell off, I would expect those inflows to stop very quickly and possibly reverse. So, you know, we, we do need to keep an eye on these other markets here, especially now that we're close, more closely linked than we were, uh, you know, in years past. So yeah, we're now in the stage of good news is bad news for the market. Always, yeah, always exactly. love, love, love that part <laughs> of, of the cycle. Um, George, CME open interest has been increasing pretty aggressively uh, at the same time that inflows into the ETFs have also been increasing. Do you have any kind of thoughts around why that might be? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think um, actually, I mean, what, what, what Greg just mentioned sort of with, with potential ETF outflows, right? One other angle to look at it is um, if you look at the breakdown on where, of when uh, most of the um, ETF net inflows have happened, that was probably starting around Feb 5th for about the five weeks following that. Now, um, if you look at the numbers, I think we're talking about $10.2 billion of net inflows during that five week period, roughly. Um, now, if you look across to CME open interest, um, CME open interest during that same period has increased about $7.2 billion, uh, which to me suggests that probably um, some part of that is part of, a, of the basis trade, right? Um, with with um, obviously basis being relatively attractive, like um, hovering around 12 to, to 15%, call it. Um, so that's why I think it's it's incredibly important to just uh, monitor uh, CME annualized basis levels. And um, that could be a um, good indicator for what is to come on, on the um, ETF um, flow side as well. Yeah, agreed. And, and a quick quick reminder on kind of where we sit. So outflows in total for GBC right now are just past 15 billion. And then in terms of total AUM, you've got BlackRock just above 16, Fidelity at almost 10 now, and then Grayscale just under 22. So certainly um, still a bit of movement there with it within the issuers. And uh, but good to see that the the kind of we did see a reversion back to inflows last week after uh, some outflows. But moving on to altcoins, George, what, what are some of the altcoins, some of the big moves that you have been looking at? I know, I think you were at an event recently and you were surprised at how much of the chatter within institutional participants was within meme coins. Um, but uh, that aside, what, what are some of the other big movers? 
Yeah, I could, I could almost joke that, you know, like every time like um, too many people start talking about meme coins, that could be a signal for a local top, which uh, maybe we've been seeing over the last 24 hours or so. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, it's been a really uh, weird bull market the last couple of months, at least like uh, relatively barbell shaped in a way. Um, so you have a few really high quality, strong projects and narratives that have been doing really well. But again, it's it's extremely selective, and I think if you just had, for instance, a, a sort of um, large market cap weighted or equal weighted basket of crypto, you would have probably underperformed over the last couple of months. And then on the other hand of the barbell, you sort of have like this whole uh, sort of meme coin segment, like on on Solana and and on Base, for instance. Uh, that has been doing uh, pretty well. Um, so most notably, obviously, uh, DGEN, which is um, the, the, the sort of currency used by uh, Farcaster users. And then a lot of um, base-related trades um, that, uh, like Aerodrome, for instance, um, that had done pretty well over the last week. Um, and then, for instance, if you look across to Solana, when that popped around $200 um, a couple of days ago, um, you had a quite a few Sol beta projects like Jito or uh, Jupiter or, or Pith um, doing pretty well as well. Cool. So just to kind of run through those. So Aerodrome is a DEX on base, the the L2. Um, Jito is a, a staking provider and Jupiter is a DEX as well. Now, George, I'm going to leave DGEN to you. Do you want to give a, a quick 30 uh, one-liner on what DGEN is? Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially, I mean, it's uh, it's it's sort of the community currency on on Farcaster, and I think like other. Um, so you can essentially, so if you're using Farcaster, um, you can, if you like the uh, the thread or a post that someone made, for instance, you can just comment with like a certain DGEN amount, and that's going to be uh, tipped to them um, at the, the end of the month. Um, so in a way, I guess of what um, if you remember, like there there were like these rumors like going a year, a year and a half ago that. Um, there might be um, something similar with Doge on, on Twitter. Obviously, that never materialized. Um, so, so it's essentially, yeah, this, this, this community currency. And then now there's, there's other apps like um, Dracula.app, which is uh, another social app um, that's competing with, um, uh, with TikTok. And I think they already have like 250,000 users that's also adopting it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's essentially why it's been, um, it's, it's, it's been uh, growing. Great. Thanks for summarizing that, George. That That is a perfect segue into a discussion around base. Um, and we're also going to be discussing uh, DGEN and DGEN L3. So, Sid, we'd love to bring you in here. Uh, base has had a, another bumper week. TBLs are charging up and to the right. Activity, DAUs, all the metrics are looking fantastic. Can you just give us a quick summary of what's going on on base at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so base uh, has been kind of having a renaissance moment in terms of activity, mainly uh, off the back of meme coins, um, which is uh, kind of seems to be a hard ringer for many of these ecosystems, uh, Solana, most famously earlier in the year, and then now with base. Uh, initially, there was a kind of crop of meme coins that were, um, you know, it's just a just a variation of meme coins launched by community developers. And then now we're this past week, we've kind of seen it coalesce amongst a few clear leaders, one of them including uh, DGEN, which is a bit more than just a meme coin. It in initially launched as a meme coin on top of the Farcaster network, and then um, it's grown into a much uh, larger ecosystem with its own L3 on top of base and, uh, and several other features, including tipping on the social network. Uh, and so all of this, this excitement is kind of driven this increase, uh, DGEN alone went to over $2 billion FTV uh, last week. Um, it's fallen off a little bit now, but several other tokens have kind of followed in its wake, acting as a sort of DGEN beta and driving up the entire ecosystem uh, significantly. Interesting. Wow. So when you say, when you kind of talk about activity across the ecosystem, like where else are we seeing it? Are we seeing it on DEXs? Are we seeing it on lending protocols? Are we seeing, obviously, we're seeing it on D decentralized social. Are there any new applications that are joining base as a result of this activity? Yeah, I think it's still early days, to be honest, um, where we're just getting started. There's a few nascent games right now, like Friend Pet and, and a few others. And of course, even in, uh, in from prior calls, we discussed Friend Tech, uh, the the other social application that had a pretty strong run in base or late last year, which is rumored to uh, potentially have uh, you know a season, a, another season for their app and potentially incentives down the line. So uh, I think all of this might coalesce into further 
a further run of new applications for Brace. Uh, currently, Aerodrome is the leading DEX in terms of volumes. They're incentivizing different tokens uh, with with uh, tight incentives for tight ranges. Um, so. Um, generally speaking, liquidity providers don't suffer as much IL just because the incentives more than make up for it if, if a certain asset goes out of range. So slightly different model used by Aerodrome, uh, which just seemed to be, uh, you know, drawing a lot of attention and success. Very cool. And then back to kind of forecast, uh, how's it been again with frames? I mean, they were they obviously a ton of fanfare recently. I think it's continuing to grow. Are there any new applications within frames or, or forecast specifically? Yeah, so frames, uh, basically, the, the, they're, they're just continuing to make iterative additions to the protocol. Uh, so Farcaster, as mentioned previously, is a decentralized um, social uh, social media protocol where on top of it, the Farcaster team has built a client or an interface called Warpcast where folks can scroll the social feed and see different channels and interact with people. Um, but uh, frames basically allow for folks to build mini apps on the feed itself that people can interact with. And iteratively, they've been adding features to frames, including the ability to make transactions uh, with frames. Um, and now they're slowly adding more support for more chains uh, that these transactions are doable on. And now they're also trying to add um, more support for interactive button activity within the app itself, uh, including for, for tipping, for example. Uh, DGEN is one of the biggest use cases here where folks have been tipping DGEN uh, for good contributions on the social media um, you know, side of things where whenever someone makes a good post, people are tipped uh, for that post. Uh, and because of this run-up in DGEN, the, the base value of these tips have increased from cents to several hundred to even a thousand dollars per tip. Um, so that's been interesting to see. And then in terms of frame use cases per se, we haven't seen that many new novel applications just because it's, you know the building blocks are still pretty raw, but they're continuing to evolve. Last week, an interesting one I saw was the ability to set up an LLC, a complete entity wow. from a frame, just to click through it. Wow, that's that's kind of incredible. So, so it's a kind of the composability aligned with value transfer um, within a social feed, which is all kind of coming together. Um, and I guess that's the whole point of DeFi, right? It's that composability, which we're all excited about. And we're just now starting to see post 4844 transaction costs come down. We're on L2 as well. So a lot more use cases are, are possible. Now, we're also hearing a lot about DGEN L3. So L2s haven't been around too long. We're now on to L3s. Can you just give us a quick summary of like, I guess, what, what's the value prop of an L3 and, and what is DGEN L3 specifically? Yeah, so the value prop on L3 is basically you can think of it like an app-specific chain with each of the components of a, of a chain infrastructure kind of modularized. So DJ in particular, they use this infrastructure provider called Syndicate where they used base for as a settlement layer and then uh, Arbitrum Orbit as a kind of execution layer and then um, um, uh, I believe uh, they used uh, an, another kind of data availability solution uh, conduit um, uh, for for you know to facilitate you know data availability and so they kind of split up these components and um, and uh, what it allows the DGen team to do is basically to design a chain ecosystem with any rules that they kind of want so in this case they've utilized DGen the token as the base currency for the chain uh, and uh, and you know it also has allowed them to push fees down significantly because it's. It's almost like a, a roll up on top of a roll up, right? So uh, base itself is a roll up on top of Ethereum, uh, and they're settling on base. So the fees are infinitesimal, um, and especially with DGen, with, with its kind of primary use case of micro tips happening on the social layer. Uh, currently, these tips are only collected at the end of every month now uh, uh, by users of the protocol. Potentially, this chain allows them to change that to tips to be collected in instantaneously on the L3 because fees are so low, it actually makes this feasible. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I, I love the idea of that kind of like streaming payments. So if you, as you kind of go into a world of like autonomous X, Y, Z and someone's borrowing your car and you want to get a streaming payment for that or um, IoT devices talking to one another um, and the kind of those payments going back and forth in real time, I think is is, is amazing. Um, George, we'd love to bring you in here. I know you have been a DGen with DGen and Farcaster for quite some time. Curious, how, what have you been playing with uh, with regards to uh, Farcaster, DGen, etc.? Yeah, I think like I mean, a super interesting thing about it is that it has like um, this this super crypto native, um, very strong community as well, right? And I think um, with DGen specifically, I think it, it just um, 
the felt really nice that I think your transaction fees were like one billionth of a cent. So I don't think you can get much closer to zero than that. Um, I think the, the only thing is that at the moment it takes seven days to bridge out of DGEN again. Um, if you sell something on the chain to bridge over to base again. Uh, so, um, sort of, um, from a trading perspective, I guess uh, that might be more selling pressure and more folks are, are trying to bridge out. Um, uh, but, uh, hopefully soon, um, that there'll be faster, more, more efficient, um, bridges. I think the, the other thing on, on Farcaster is, um, is also a, a pretty strong NFT community and, and, you know, like as a sort of Farcaster was evolving, there's like different airdrops that were happening and, um, different kind of NFTs. Um, developing around that, like um, uh, Farcaster OGs or, or on-chain Gaia's, for instance, which are all um, interesting uh, community-driven uh, projects. And in the end, I think um, that Dan Romero was, was posting that um, there are up to about 70,000 uh, daily active users um, most recently. If you compare that to Twitter, um, Twitter is saying that, or, or X rather, they're saying that they're at about 200 to 250 million daily active, uh, active users. Um, so, you know, like even if, if Farkas gets to, to 1% of that, like, uh, and then eventually 10%, I mean, that's going to be a huge. So I think what I heard there, George, is your wallet is getting full of new <laughs> NFTs for this cycle um, to complement the ones from, your, from last cycle. Is that, <laughs> is that about right? <laughs> yeah, let's 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 see. Let's see if, there, if there's a dip. <laughs> right, very cool. Um, and also, we were talking about um, one of the trades of the year. Um, I think one of you mentioned it to me earlier on. One confirmation, I think, had a million dollars of DGen, which is now worth north of a hundred million dollars. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, they actually did this as an investment to fund the DGen team and their development in uh, early this year and in, in in early February. And that was a million dollars invested, and and at current rates, it's slightly under a hundred million, but it was a hundred million this this week, so pretty significant um, uh, bet. I think it's probably the trade of the year by far. Wow, well, well done, one confirmation team. Uh, very, very impressive. I wish I could find a few of those. Um, awesome. Uh, so, Chit said, what else? I know there's been some uh, interesting happening, interesting things happening with regards to governance for some of the kind of the um, DeFi 1.0 protocols. Yeah, so a little bit of a contentious debate happening right now on the governance forums with uh, MakerDAO and Aave. So uh, MakerDAO has been trying to spur interest in their DAI stablecoin and so have been aggressively trying to allocate more rewards for pools of, that contain DAI, including their own protocol, Spark protocol. Uh, and more, more recently, they kind of offered the lending, lending borrow protocol Morpho a credit line of DAI. Uh, from the from MakerDAO Treasury themselves, and so in response to this, the competing lending protocol Aave, uh, the, there was a there was a governance proposal from a Aave community member that uh, encouraged folks to uh, the, the 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 voters to uh, you know, to to, sub, to agree to a vote to reduce the LTV of Dai, uh, the collateral um, ratio to zero percent. Uh, across all Aave networks uh, and across all chains, which seemed to be a little bit of a drastic move. Uh, mainly the justification made was that they were fearing some sort of destabilization with DAI itself, potentially a DPEG, which could put Aave the protocol at risk if people borrowed using DAI as collateral. Um, but, you know, folks have been commenting underneath this proposal saying it's a bit of a drastic measure. Uh, you don't have to go directly to zero. Maybe you could get a, go to a safer collateral ratio first and then see how it goes. Interesting. So, is that something that we're going to see playing out in the next, in the coming days? Like when is that proposal actually voted on? Yeah, it's again, it's probably a couple of weeks now, but this is the discussion is ongoing right now, and probably they'll put up a first snapshot vote within this coming week, and then we'll see where consensus is at. Interesting. Okay, cool. One to keep an eye on. Uh, next, airdrops, a couple of very, very big ones. Let's start with Wormhole. So we've got $670 million of W tokens that are going to be airdropped to users of the Wormhole Bridge. A uh, quick reminder, that is a bridge between uh, Solana and some of the uh, EVM chains. Um, Coinbase Ventures is an investor, but we, we, don't, we don't have a, a kind of a price on those tokens yet, and I'm not sure they don't appear to be listed. Um, Sid, I guess, how should we think about that airdrop? Is that something that is going to... Just sit in people's wallets for some time until the token starts to trade, or, or is it used for governance? Like, yeah, how should we think about it? Um, I think I think uh, people can draw parallels to uh, Pith, uh, which is uh, another 
kind of uh, Oracle data layer availability on, on Solana that also launched by an airdrop. Um, you know, it kind of kickstarted a lot of Solana airdrop season uh, earlier uh, in the year. And uh, I think we probably see that similar kind of effect coming back into Solana with, uh, you know, any airdrop kind of creates money out of thin air in a, in a way, when there, especially when there's a trading market for that token. And so you kind of see a wealth effect trickle into other areas of the ecosystem. So we likely see something like that. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then the next one is Athena. So Athena, we've got a, a large airdrop. Maybe before we get into that, Greg, maybe if you could join and just kind of run us through what Athena is as a, as a, as a protocol. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, Athena is a really interesting project. Um, what they have is they have a stable coin and they take the proceeds um, from that stable coin and they uh, essentially put on the ETH perp funding trade. So they're long either ETH or staked ETH, and then they short the uh, the perp against that and earn that funding rate, which, you know, we've talked about on this uh, call before has been, you know, as high as 70%. Right now it's around 15%. Um, but that yield uh, goes to folks that have staked that stable coin. Um, so it's just a really interesting way to, um, to participate in the the perp funding trade without having to manage you know the collateral side of it great thanks thanks for that greg so breaking it down a little bit what's actually going on in the background yeah so what they're doing is they're buying either eth or uh, a liquid staked eth product um and then they're also shorting uh perpetual eth perpetual futures uh against that creating a del delta neutral position um and what's really interesting about this is because it's on chain you can actually see um these positions you can you know see where the eth is uh, they break down you know what counterparties they're using uh for the short perps um and you know just bringing that transparency to the product uh i think is one of the reasons people are getting so excited about this perfect and what does that mean in terms of utilizing those assets because they're on chain can you start to use them for margin and things like that yeah so you can use your um you can use the, the stable coin as you would you know any other stable coin uh usdc DAI, usdt um you can also use the staked version of the stable coin um so it really allows you know really nice composability between you know, this protocol and others uh, on chain. Perfect. So let's say I'm using a um, a perp dex and uh, I need some margin there in order to put a position on. Instead of using USDT, I could use USDE, receive the basis for my dollar token, while also utilizing that token to put on some leverage. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, I would be. To me, that's kind of leverage on top of leverage, um, or could be. So, um, but you could certainly do that. Interesting. Is it? I mean, the, the basis position is is market neutral, though. So, how how is that leverage on leverage? Well, I think the risk here is that funding rates go negative and they stay negative for a long time. Now, uh, the protocol has given this a lot of thought, and they do have an insurance fund set up, um, and that insurance fund is designed basically stabilize things if funding rates do go negative. Um, but if you know they were to go negative uh, and stay negative for a long period of time, it's conceivable that you could eat through that insurance fund. Um, so it's just one risk that uh, worth being aware of. Okay, that makes sense. And, and I guess as the, as the return on the asset staked asset gets lower and lower, less people would probably want to hold it, which probably means they redeem USD, which means they probably take some of that basis off as well, potentially. Yeah, exactly. And they'd, um, or they could sell it, um, which would mean it could potentially trade at a lower price than its conceivable fair value. Yeah. Um, Greg, I know you used to trade rates in uh, TradFi. Like, I guess, is this similar to any kind of more traditional products that you've traded in the past? I mean, it's a really nice and easy way to, uh, you know, capture perp funding rates or trade basis. Um, again, without having to manage, you know, a spot leg and a, a derivative leg and, uh, you know, all the collateral that comes with that. 
Um, I think the reason we're seeing, you know, high rates for, you know, borrowing stable coins, uh, we've talked about that some, high funding rates in, uh, you know, PERP markets is because right now there's just this thirst for, for leverage or thirst for dollars in the system. Um, so folks that are willing to supply that leverage, um, you know, they're able to earn pretty high rates, you know, talking, you know, 15 20, 30%. Interesting. And back to the airdrop. So Sid, what does the airdrop look like? Um, how many people, how many tokens, et cetera? Yeah, so um, the airdrop is pretty significant uh, on, uh, you know, at current standing, at current market rates, it's uh, approximately around $450 million worth of tokens being distributed with the top airdrop recipients getting close to $2 million and, and several with, uh, over a million dollars, and then several over several fi over five hundred k dollars. Interesting, and I guess from an FTV perspective, we're now north of ten billion dollars. It's at north of a billion dollars of twenty four hour volume. So certainly a, a project of interest to uh, to a lot of people. Um, well, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you, George. Thank you, Greg. Thank you to the rest of the team for helping out as always. Um, and have a good week, everyone. Take care.